So I want to say a warm hello and welcome to all the participants on today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you here with us today for a webinar on a technical note on girls associated with armed groups and forces. My name is Yang Fu and I'm a child protection and emergency specialist working for Plan International Germany. And I have the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, Sandra Mignon. Um, Sandra is a technical advisor on children associated with armed forces and armed groups, and she works for Plan International. And Sandra, alongside our colleagues from UNICEF, is co-leading a working group on children associated with armed groups and forces under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And the Alliance is a network of over 100 members who work on establishing norms and providing technical support. And this webinar is part of, of that initiative. Um, Sandra is also the author of this technical note on girls associated with armed um, forces and armed groups. And today she's going to present her, uh, the results of her research and the recommendations on how we can improve programming um, for girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. During her presentation, um, I welcome everybody to share your questions or comments in the Q&A box. And we've set aside 15 minutes at the end today to try and, and answer those questions and have a little bit of a discussion. So Sandra, I wanna say thanks so much for being with us here today and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Yang. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very pleased to see so many people joining us today for this webinar. So the purpose of this webinar, as Yang said, uh, is to share the findings from uh, the research and the technical note, and specifically some recommendations for uh, field practitioners and donors on how to program effectively for girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. So this presentation is a summary of the findings and encourage you to have a look at the technical note for more detailed information. So first, I'd like to share with you some uh, information about the unique experience of girls. Um, a lot of um, research has been done and a lot of tools have been developed as well, but often this is with boys uh, in mind. And I think to program effectively for, for CAFAC and particularly for girls, it's important to acknowledge the difference in, in experiences that girls uh, may have as compared to, to boys. So the first thing is uh, to look at the forms of recruitment. And so I've studied uh, 37 armed forces and armed groups. And among those groups that I've documented, about 49% uh, use abduction to recruit girls. So we can see that this is one of the preferred mode of recruitment uh, for girls. And what we've seen in some contexts is that they are targeting specifically girls because they are perceived to be more uh, obedient, more flexible than boys, for example. Child marriage is another mode of recruitment that is specific to girls. Uh, sometimes the marriage is um, under threat, uh, or sometimes it's not. And in that case, then the girls will be married to a fighter. And then in some cases, uh, this can be also institutionalized by the, by the armed group. So for example, the Islamic State in, in Iraq has institutionalized child marriage where girls were married to fighters. And if the fighter would die, for example, the girl will be immediately remarried to another fighter. Propaganda is a mode of recruitment or a form of recruitment that is um, also applicable to boys. Here, what we see is that they're using um, education and then uh, the schools, for example, to infuse ideology and gradually um, get children to believe in the cause and then to enroll. Um, we've seen also that they have used books, for example, of stories with Arabic female fighters that girls can identify to. A close relationship with uh, a fighter can also be a mode of recruitment. We've seen that in Colombia for about 10% of the girls who have been recruited with the FARC. And this is also a common mode of recruitment in Liberia and, and Sierra Leone, where it used to be. So the recruitment is also affected by a number of risk factors. Um, that will influence um, the recruitment. So those risk factors are organized around the socio-ecological framework. Here we can look at the different levels. Um, so first, the individual level. 
we know that for girls, um, the need for protection is one of the first uh, risk factors. So if they live in an environment where there is a lot of violence against girls, um, they tend to seek protection from the armed group. Some of them seek also independence and empowerment, particularly if they live in patriarchal societies. Um, they look for adventure and fun, the, the desire for meaning, glory, or in some other cases, it can be uh, revenge as well. We know that poverty has also an impact on the recruitment to meet their basic needs. At the family level, um, we know that poor relationship with caregivers, um, sexual abuse, forced marriage can lead to recruitment. So the girls want to take over control over their life. A strong family ties with uh, an armed group, for example, will also lead um, to, to or may lead to recruitment of girls. At the community level, in some cases, there is a pressure from the community on parents to marry their girls in exchange of peace, for example, and protection from the armed group. And in other cases, the community ties with uh, armed groups and armed forces, such as uh, self-defense groups, for example, um, may have also an influence on the recruitment. At the society level, there are various factors. Um, some of them are the lack of access to services, the low presence of the state, the marginalization of minority groups, and uh, limited economic opportunities. What is important here is to note that those factors uh, can be very specific to a context but also that it's usually the accumulation of risk factors and the absence of protective factors that can lead to recruitment. So it's rarely one factor, but rather multiple factor combined that will contribute to, uh, to recruitment. So next, uh, still on the, on the experience of girls, uh, I wanted to share with you some findings um, about their life in the armed forces and armed groups. And what we found here is that the girls are experiencing some control, uh, some control over their bodies. Most girls don't have the choice to have sexual relationships or not, to have children or not. So like people decide for them um, how, how to use their bodies. There is also control over their movement. They have usually less freedom of movement than boys, and particularly if they have been abducted. In terms of personal hygiene, uh, the management of menstruation in the bush can be very challenging. There is often poor access to uh, clean water and to um, toiletries. And that leads to a sense of loss of dignity. So some girls have reported that, that in the bush uh, where they could not keep their personal hygiene. In terms of health, uh, girls are exposed to unsafe abortion, unsafe delivery in the bush. Um, the results of sexual abuse, like sexual transmitted disease on the fistula and not enough food during that pregnancy. So these can have long-term consequences on the health. In terms of mental health, there are some research in some countries that are showing that there are higher psychological distress experienced by girls uh, as compared to boys. And uh, this is often because of the level of stigma, which is definitely higher uh, for girls, as well as a sense of shame and guilt that they experience when they are forced to commit act of violence. Girls also um, develop some individual and collective agency. Uh, and this is to regain a sense of control over their life. And that can be done through supporting each other. They have some survival strategies um, that can be uh, very positive where girls protect each other for sexual abuse, for example, and some individual uh, survival strategies as well. So for example, we've seen some girls becoming even more violent than boys, and this is to earn respect and protect themselves. In terms of role and responsibilities, um, here we make a distinction between the indirect participation in hostilities and the direct participation in hostilities. So for the indirect participation, girls are often playing support roles. Um, so there are cooks, porters, they wash clothes, they look after the children of combatants, um, but there are also spies, messengers, recruiters, translators, medical assistant, um, logistician. They're also often uh, exposed to sexual exploitation. So 
out of the 37 armed forces and armed groups documented, we found that 60% of them have sexually exploited girls. And there seems to be also a link between abduction, so uh, the mode of recruitment for abduction and sexual abuse. So 78% of the armed forces and armed group that have used abduction have also uh, sexually abused the girls. So the girls here play different roles. They can be bushwives, uh, they can be gang raped. And there are also contexts uh, like in Iraq with the Islamic State again, where um, sexual abuse has been institutionalized, uh, particularly with Yazidis. In terms of direct participation, we see that girls are playing various roles as well. Um, they can be radio operators, uh, weapon cleaners, combatants. In some cases, they've been used as suicide bombers. And uh, in contexts like uh, CR or DRC, they prepared um, the talisman and amulets for some, some of the groups. So this is just to give you an overview of some of the, um, the experiences of girls that can be different uh, as compared to boys. So now these are some global recommendations um, that cut across all the different stages, so from prevention to uh, the release and the reintegration. The first recommendation, if you want to program for girls, is to uh, conduct a context and gender analysis. And that's really important so that you can uh, document and have a full understanding of the risk factors that can lead to girls' recruitment, as well as the protective factors that can prevent recruitment. Um, then you can also document the challenges that girls face in leaving armed forces and armed groups, and the challenges in accessing services, the stigma they may face uh, upon their return, and this is to avoid doing harm. The second point is to acknowledge uh, the girl's agency and the decision they may have taken at some point uh, to enroll in armed group, and this was taken based on the situation at this time. So this is something that girls have reported in a number of places that they felt really disempowered. So in acknowledging their agency, we empower them to be actors on their, on their reintegration and not just passive victims. And that link to that, uh, it's also important to involve girls in the project design and in the implementation. They know what they need. They know what could prevent their recruitment. They know what could facilitate their release or their reintegration. So it's important to involve them from the design phase of the project. And the last global recommendation is to identify what I call those community influencers and allies. So these are people who are in the communities and who have the power to shift social norms. People um, will listen to them and will listen to what to say. And so they have this, uh, this power to make recruitment unacceptable, for example, um, to improve community acceptance uh, for girls or to help them relieve their guilt. So now let's look more specifically at the prevention. So here we've organized prevention around two different approaches that are complementary. The first one is a multi-level approach. The multi-level approach, so is looking at uh, the socio-ecological model in terms of risk factors and protective factors. So those factors needs to be documented in each uh, context. And then uh, the idea is to address the risk factors and to strengthen the protective factors um, at all levels of the socio-ecological model. So if you address only one level, let's say the family level, it's unlikely that this will be enough to effectively prevent recruitment. Uh, it's really important to, to look at all the levels of the socio-ecological framework. So in the technical note, you will find some suggestions of interventions at all levels. Then we have the multi-sector approach. So here the idea is that the child protection sector alone uh, will unlikely be able to prevent recruitment. This should be a shared responsibility across all relevant sectors. So then the child protection actors can uh, coordinate and promote missing services, for example, in areas where we know there is active recruitment. So for example, if as a risk factor, you have identified the lack of uh, quality education in, in a particular location, then uh, you will involve the education sector to address this issue. And that can be replicated for all the sectors. So 
if we know that food security is a big issue and that leads to uh, recruitment, then you need to involve uh, food security actors and, and so on. So then let's move to the release phase. So here there are some key considerations. First of all, we know the, the identification of girls is extremely challenging. And that's all the people, uh, all the key informants that I've talked to have really um, raised this challenge. The second thing is that we can cause harm in actively identifying girls. So when you identify a girl and then you label her as uh, a former CAFAG, um, you may put her at risk. Um, the other point is that we know that the formal DDR uh, release programs are usually less successful with girls. There are a number of reasons to that, um, uh, but mainly it's because of the military nature uh, of those processes. And girls tend to not feel very comfortable um, interacting with um, armed forces, with uh, the military. And, and tend to prefer those informal modes of release where they go back to their community discreetly and kind of self-demobilize uh, in a way. I also would like to highlight that more and more the exit trajectories uh, vary significantly from one child to another, but also from one context to another. And we see less and less those processes where the child was enrolled and then there is that demobilization process and release, and then the child is uh, back in the community demobilized. Now we see more and more those back and forth between the group and the family or the community where the child tends to go back and forth and not fully demobilize until later on. And so here we make the difference, uh, the distinction between the desistance and the disengagement. So what we mean by desistance is the cessation of activity for the group, and that includes uh, support activities, for example. That's the first step. But this doesn't mean that the child or the girl is fully disengaged. And then we have a second step where there is actual disengagement, where the girl will de-identify herself as a member of the group. And for example, we see particularly girls who are married to fighters, or to commanders, who are part of a demobilization process, um, who are part of uh, even a reintegration process, who are still part of the group. Uh, at least um, their feeling, their identity is still being part of the group. So they're not fully disengaged. So that's something to, to keep in mind. So uh, in terms of recommendations for the release, there are some two overarching recommendations. The first one is to always assume that girls have been recruited because when you have that assumption, even if you don't have any uh, formal data that they've been recruited, then you will program differently. And we have a very good experience from South Sudan where before 2018, only 1% 1 of the CAFAG identified were girls. And after 2018, the DDR actors have shifted their approach and they were able to identify up to 38% of girls. So you see how like just the way you program, the way you um, orient your, your program uh, for the release may have an impact on the number of girls you identify. The second point is um, to have to set up both the formal and informal modes of release. So girls tend to prefer the informal modes of release. So it's important to have both options to maximize the opportunities to identify them. So let's look more in detail about uh, formal release. So we have some experiences from South Sudan as well as from a few other countries where we found out that um, having some trained military child protection focal points in military units and DDR teams um, was really helpful to negotiate the release of children uh, with armed groups leaders as compared to civilians. So for example, civilian child protection actors were not as credible in a way and armed groups leaders felt more respected and therefore more open to negotiation to release girls and boys when they were interacting with military personnel. Um, the second point is that when you have um, those programs of demobilization, 
and you have those uh, contentment side where you have combatants and commanders um, usually they tend to hide girls um, they pretend they are their daughters or their wife and this is because they feel they are their positions so it's very difficult to identify these girls so providing services directly to girls such as vaccination for for them for their children some uh, reproductive health services, for example, may help to build trust with the girls and then give them uh, give an opportunity to explain them their rights and their options to stay in the armed group, for example, or not. So often they don't even know they have an opportunity to leave because they don't have access to that information. Some community members may have also uh, more access to armed groups, particularly when they are those groups are community self-defense armed groups. And so it's important to engage as male and female community members, uh, along other duty actors in, in this demobilization process. In terms of informal release, so as I said, this is a preferred mode of release for girls. So this is when girls go back to their community by themselves, to their family or where they tend to hide. So here we can establish or strengthen community level mechanism to safely identify girls who have been, uh, who have informally exited um, the armed groups and then refer them to child protection actors. So here I don't necessarily mean only and the traditional child protection committees. This can be other existing mechanisms. So for example, in Somalia, um, a traditional women and girls solidarity network helped to identify girls who were associated and then they were referred to child protection actors. The second point is the provision of what I call non-targeted services. So these are services where girls don't have to disclose their association. And we know they will more likely access those services if they don't have to self-identify as, as former CAFAG. Um, this will also contribute to a decrease of the resentment from the population against them. In some places, the, the host committee, the, the local committee doesn't understand why uh, CAFAG, have, former CAFAG have access to services and not the rest of the population. This may also reduce the incentive of children to join armed groups to access then those services. The last point uh, here is building off an experience in West Africa where they realized that some girls were still in the armed groups, had the opportunity to leave, but really feared their family and community rejection. And so they organized some video recording from their parents, from community members, where they were saying that they would welcome their girls, their daughters back uh, to the community. And then they were able to disseminate those messages to the girls who were still in the armed groups. And that really had an influence, an impact on girls uh, feeling more um, accepted and then wanted to leave, uh, to leave the armed group. So now let's move to the reintegration. So there are some key considerations as well to, to keep in mind when you program for girls and their reintegration. The first thing is that the level of stigma for girls is more severe, it lasts longer, and is more difficult to decrease than for boys. And that's uh, read numerous research, and, and it's really clear that the impact of association for girls is stronger than for boys. We know so that the presence of children and then the experiences of sexual abuse, whether it's real or just assumed or perceived by the community will likely increase the level of stigma. And the last point is to uh, take into consideration the personal experiences of girls. Not all of them have the same experience. They are not all survivors of sexual abuse. Uh, some of them may have positions of power and that reintegration in that reintegration process, they may find it very difficult to return to gender stereotype roles, for example, or in situation where they lose the power they used to have. So I'm thinking of girls who were combatants, um, but also situations where girls were the wife of a commander, for example, and they were in a situation of power in the armed group. So these personal situations need to be taken into consideration uh, when you design the program for, for individuals. So the safety and care is one of the first outcome that we seek for the reintegration process. So some girls may need alternative care. And um, in that situation, 
there is some anecdotal evidence from a few countries that shows that girls who go through a foster care system for foster families or kinship care reintegrate more successfully than girls who go for interim care centers. And I think that's really interesting to explore further. There are also other experiences where that shows that placing two girls in one foster family increases the chances of successful reintegration. And then in that case, we see how girls form a support network um, that contributes to build their resilience. And so it's easier to adapt to a new situation because there are two of them that support each other and then they really speed up the, the reintegration process. In terms of legal support, in some places, um, securing civil documentation may enhance the girl's sense of safety and their ability to move freely uh, in some places. So this can include an exit certificate. Um, in some places, this is a requirement. It can be also a birth certificate, for example. In terms of social uh, reintegration, there are a, a number of levels uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. And the first one is um, how the family plays an essential role in the success of that reintegration process. There is numerous research that showed the positive impact of welcoming families on their psychosocial well-being and on their uh, social reintegration. The way the family will welcome back the children, the girl in particular, um, will have a very strong impact on how the girls will see herself, is she accepted or not? But also it will have an impact on how the community will accept her. Often the community watch what, how the family welcomes the girls and then they will mirror that acceptance or, or not. In families, we also include partners. There are situations where girls were married before their recruitment or, or they got married after. And so th those partners need also to be included in all the support that, that is provided to the family before their integration and during the whole reintegration process so that they can provide a supportive environment. The next point is on education. Um, so education has been highlighted by girls to help them retrieve uh, what some of them call their lost value. Due to the association, some of them have uh, lost that social value because they've been sexually abused. So having a diploma or a certificate can help them rebuild their sense of self-worth for themselves, but also that social value from the community perspective. What is important here is that all the services for formal and non-formal education that is provided to girls are not targeted to girls who were associated only, but really uh, offer to all the girls who are vulnerable in the community, for example. So here the third recommendation involves the community influencers and those people who will be able to shift the social norms related to stigma uh, and to discrimination in the community. So we know if we identify those people, um, there are things like community dialogues that those influencers can lead and it's really driven by the community rather than imposed by the NGO. And that has shown some positive results in, in some location. There are also some uh, innovative awareness raising campaign that I found very interesting uh, in Nigeria, uh, for example, where they use those drama plays and radio talk shows. And they've developed a, a radio, some radio episodes where CAFA characters uh, face rejection from the community. And these approach seems to have contributed to a raise of empathy. All of a sudden you feel for those children, you see how they, they face rejection. And this has contributed to reduce stigma. This approach is to uh, change social norms take a lot of time. So these are things that are more like kind of grand work that needs to be done uh, for quite a long period of time to gradually shift those social norms. So it's, it's really happening uh, overnight. Now uh, I'd like to talk about the health um, of girls. And so we've seen that they're experiencing some um, specific health issues. Um, so one of the first things is to conduct a medical assessment. And that includes um, screening impairments, looking at pathologies that are a result of sexual abuse, like called um, uh, sexually um, 
transmitted disease and infections, um, the fistula, that includes uh, wounds as well, that includes injuries as a result of those unsafe delivery or, or abortion issues uh, related to drug and alcohol addiction, for example. The girls have highlighted that for them, the discretion and the confidentiality um, from the, the health service providers was really important. And that's particularly key for the unmarried girls uh, who are seeking help for sexual and reproductive health. Well, that's something to, to keep in mind as you work also with health uh, practitioners. In terms of mental health, um, I'd like to highlight what I call the power of collective approaches. And that's been highlighted in multiple studies. So encouraging girls to meet other girls who have been associated with armed forces and armed groups um, has shown positive impact on their resilience. There are some locations where they have implemented like a group reintegration approach that has also demonstrated positive outcome. So the fact that girls meet other girls who had the same experience really strengthen that sense of collective agency, that sense that I'm not alone experiencing this, you know, other people, and that really helped to, to build their resilience. There are also experiences of what we call cleansing and welcoming ceremonies. Um, there are also those uh, forgiving ceremonies as long as they're not harmful for the girls, um, they can be successful to promote reintegration uh, and to reduce the psychosocial distress. And so there are some research from South Sudan, Mozambique, Uganda, and Nepal that are showing some positive results. As long as this is a request from the girl and not something that is imposed uh, on them. So the next point is on financial self-sufficiency. So here you can note that I'm not talking about livelihood activities. Or the outcome we're seeking here is financial self-sufficiency. And this is what the girls have said. This is what they need. And too often the programs, the livelihood programs that are implemented for CAFAG do not seek a financial self-sufficiency. They have other impact, and I've read some of the devaluations report. Um, but the, the impact on um, this financial self sufficiency is often limited. There are other uh, good outcomes, um, often on more like mental health and psychosocial well being outcomes, or are, are positive. But here, um, we feel like there are some recommendations that there needs to be. Um, shared. So the first thing is to do a market assessment. And that's quite common. But it's it should be conducted at a community level where the girl will be uh, reintegrated. And uh, this assessment should also include an assessment of individual situation. Some girls may have access to uh, family business networks, like from an uncle who is involved in a particular business, for example, and that can be leveraged for um, the establishment of a business for, for a girl, for example. The basic business skills and financial literacy is really critical. That should always be combined with a vocational training on a particular trade, for instance. And that includes also how to separate family and business affairs and how to resist family, partners, and friends' pressure. It should also include networking. So there are some good experiences where a former CAFA or just youth benefiting from those programs, uh, networking, supporting each other, establishing their business uh, next to each other so they can, um, they can support each other. Access to microcredit and also mentorship, particularly from uh, women who have succeeded, who have established their, their business successfully in the community, can provide that mentorship to girls. And all those things can contribute to the sustainability of their business. And the last point here uh, that I would really like to emphasize is to avoid those one size fits all program. They're the same for older children where the girls have access to three choices of trades uh, that are gender specific, um, typically the, uh, the tailoring and the hairdressing really need to move away from this. 
and to look at what are the, the needs of individuals, what are their resources, their capacity, so that we can build off what is already there. Now I'd like to move to some girls who have some specific needs. So these are situations where girls, um, for example, are um, survivors of sexual abuse and then who need some additional support. So here it is. Nothing really new. Anonymous access to services is really important so they don't have to disclose they've been associated. There is integration of GBV services into less sensitive services. That's also quite typical. Here I'd like also to share some uh, experiences where the engagement from community influencers, again, uh, were able to decrease stigmatization. The stigmatization of those girls is extremely high. And in South Sudan, in, um, in Iraq, the mobilization of those religious leaders contributed to a reduction of stigma. So, for example, in South Sudan, the religious leaders acknowledged that girls were raped and then it was not their fault. And they used some um, religious uh, text to, to really found all their, um, their commitment, and that was extremely powerful. Same in Iraq with the Yazidi girls, a fatwa was issued that really um, helped to welcome back to those girls. So these are some examples. It's not always, all the contexts are not the same. And then uh, the community doesn't always uh, reject the girls. So it's a matter of finding who are those people who can, can help you shift the social norms. So um, now I'd like to talk about the girls who have children born of sexual violence. And, these girls generally will need more support than the other girls. And then they need support in the registration of their children's birth. Um, that can be very challenging in the absence of the father. In some contexts, uh, girls may be at risk and uh, they may need to relocate to safer places. And that's often in urban areas where they usually find a greater anonymity, where they feel safer to raise their children. Economic support is really key for them so they can provide for their child and not be a burden to their family. And that will also influence their community acceptance. So if the community sees that they're able to provide for their family, that will reduce the stigma. They also need child care to have equal access to services in the same way that other girls uh, who don't have children so that we uh, give them the same chances to access services, to build their skills, to learn a new trade, for example. Some girls may also face challenges to build a positive relationship with their child, um, and that's because of the circumstances of their conception. So they may need support to build attachment uh, with their child, to encourage positive parenting practices, and that can be done through group counseling, for example, or parenting skills. Some children um, may also have difficulties, and that's the children uh, of these girls may have difficulties to build their social identity. And that's as they grow up, particularly around adolescence, they will need support to build uh, the social identity. And that's particularly true if their father is considered as an enemy. My last slide is on uh, girls with disabilities. And um, here I have to say that I really struggle to, to find information around those girls. It seems that impairment and disabilities is not well documented. And so one of the first recommendation to me is to um, use systematically the Washington group set of questions during the medical screening to identify uh, impairments. Some impairments are not so visible and they can be difficult to diagnose. So for example, um, a hearing impairment or a visual impairment and that can be due to an explosion, for example, these things are very difficult to diagnose without asking the relevant questions. So having those uh, questions used systematically may help to, to diagnose more, more frequently the, those impairments. So then these girls will need uh, probably additional support for their social inclusion, for access to services, and, and their parents will also need support to provide a caring home environment. So that's the end of my presentation. 
don't know if you have uh, any questions. Thanks so much, Sandra. We have several, several really interesting questions. And I'm going to start with the first one that we received from Roberta Cicchetti. And she'd like to know when you talked about the risk factors at the start of your presentation, um, do risk factors change with the age of, of the girls? So younger children, younger adolescents, older adolescents? The risk factors. Um, hmm. That's a good question. I haven't seen in, in my research uh, that being well documented. So it doesn't mean that it's not happening, that there are not differences, but I, it hasn't been documented very uh, in details. And usually, yeah, we look at this period of adolescence. It's more about the individual experiences. And some of them may experience, I don't know, like this uh, difficult relationship with their parents at, at, at different ages. And this will have more impact than, than their age in, in itself, if that makes sense. Thanks, Sandra. Um, we also received a group of questions around um, the challenges of stigma facing these girls and how that might pose a challenge with their um, reintegration. So uh, Wei Hui Wang wants to know, you know, how can we mitigate against community stigmatization? For example, if a community finds out that a specific service or activity that we're providing also serves um, children associated with armed groups and forces and perhaps as a result, other parents are unwilling to send their children to these mm -hmm. activities. Colleen Fitzgerald also asks, have you found anything specifically around traditional practices that promote social reintegration um, and how these can be used to promote girls uh, reintegration specifically? So around for the first questions around the stigmatization, it's, as I mentioned, is really finding the way to raise empathy. I think as soon as people hear what they've been through, and, and of course this needs to be done in a sensitive way, we don't want to expose girls to a crowd where they have to tell their personal stories, but it can be done in a direct way, like um, those um, radio shows, and those radio episodes that were done. There are also places where they've done uh, community dialogues where Children were coming from armed groups that were, say, quite uh, open, where people didn't think it was such a big deal. So these are usually armed groups that are a self-defense uh, brigade. Uh, so it's a lot less sensitive than other armed groups. And the children were able to share their personal stories. And parents and community members who were there all of a sudden realized so many things they had no idea of. And and they started to feel that empathy for children and that really shifted the, the way they, they saw them. That, of course, it, it depends on the context. If you're in a context where those children are at great risk if they were identified, it's a bit harder. But there are situations where girls, and that can be done by actually uh, not necessarily former CAFAG, um, but we have um, good examples. I think it was in... Uganda, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, where girls were given a part of money to organize some activities. And some of them did some drama plays in their community where they uh, role played how they felt when they came back to their community and how the community was rejected them. And, and they really saw like a big, a uh, before and after. And all of a sudden the, the community realized that they were really um, rejecting them, that it was not fair. And that really shifted the way they perceived them. So I think it's the, those little actions that you know, can be implemented and, and it's not something that will happen overnight, it will take time, but to shift the perception uh, from, uh, from the community and raise empathy. Uh, so the second question was about traditional, just remind me, um, traditional practices that support social reintegration. So I think um, cleansing rituals were perhaps mentioned, but I'm not sure if there's any others that um, you came across. So mainly those uh, cleansing rituals, forgiving rituals, that was really powerful. Girls sometimes come back with a lot of guilt. Um, there's, I've read some testimonies of girls who said, I've killed people. 
Um, I had, I was eating food uh, that was looted. These people were really working hard for that food. And, and so they had so much guilt that was really preventing them from any reintegration. They were, um, they didn't feel that they deserved any support. So addressing that was really key. Um, and the religious leaders um, had a lot of power to, to shift that guilt. And that can be done for different ways. So it can be done for uh, public ceremonies uh, if they wish, but it can also be done for um, just um, personal rituals and ceremonies uh, with uh, someone who holds that authority, uh, who represents God in a way and says, you know, you're cleared from your sin. And, um, and for them, that was so powerful. Now they felt like they deserve to, to reintegrate into the community. Thanks for sharing that with us, Sandra. And I think it falls in, um, you mentioned community leaders and it links a bit with the question we received from Gladys Waweru. And Gladys is asking about involving female community members in some of these processes. And if you came across any good practices where um, local women were engaged or any examples where perhaps um, in context where women themselves aren't seen as equal or as tr are treated as second class citizens um, compared to men. And how do we, how can we involve um, women in these contexts mm -hmm. um, when it comes to prevention and, and reintegration? Yes, absolutely. I think women have a, a big role to play. There are situations, I'm thinking of Colombia, where the women there, the women associations are very powerful. And there they're able to identify girls and even exfiltrate girls from community where they're at risk of recruitment by the local gang uh, groups. And um, those women are so powerful um, they are, they receive uh, death threats, um, but even though they know that they want to protect the girls and, and they have access to all those networks where they can see the signs, the early signs of the girls who were um, about to be recruited and immediately they collect money. So they have all those networks where they collect money to exfiltrate the girl. So this is um, one of the best examples that I found. There is that example that I mentioned from Somalia where you have those traditional um, support mechanism for women that were able to identify girls and support them in a very discreet way. Um, and this is what really is important for, for them. Um, I think it's for all practitioners to keep in mind that as soon as you label a girl as uh, formally associated, you... Um, you prevent her from almost from being reintegrated. You immediately raise stigmatization and girls who have patiently, discreetly, uh, you know, try to reintegrate all of a sudden they are in the light as a former CAFAG. Uh, in some other situations, uh, and that really depends on the context, people know who is who and, and they know already they're, they have been recruited. So, it's not really a, a big deal. And then the matter is, is basically shifting the, the norms. But to go back to the women, they, I think also they need to be empowered. So there are places where they have already this, this power to, to shift um, social norms and influence. And then there are other places where they need to be empowered. And that's, I think, also the role of um, child protection actors to work with those systems that are already there in the community. Thanks, Sandra. I'm seeing so many good comments and questions and people sharing their experience from all over the world. And I mm -hmm. wish we had time to go through all of them. We got a couple of questions um, related around working with government and state actors. Um, so James Kamira asks, um, did you come across any successful examples where local governments led initiatives to support girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. And Sina Moru Moruan asks, um, how can the state be more involved in providing support to girls and their families? For example, families may not be, to, uh, be able to afford school fees for girls to re-enroll in school. Um, so I'm yeah, curious to see if any of any specific initiatives from um, local or state governments came out in your 
that's a harder one. Um, I haven't found anything really outstanding. I think there are good experiences where um, UNICEF, for example, has worked closely with the government and, and then managed to negotiate with armed groups. I'm thinking of uh, the Philippines, where there it seems that they that strong collaboration that took a long time uh, it, it really it didn't happen over a couple of years it was a long process but they were able to gradually build trust um, between the local government and uh, and the armed group and there um, the issue was that that um, the armed group was from a minority group that fell um, discriminated, where there was no services, etc. And where working with the local government to make those services available in those locations really helped to rebuild that trust. And that's often um, those places where you have a conflict, where you have those groups that are starting to organize themselves as armed groups, or often it's it's often because there is um, poor presence of the state, there is very few services. So if we manage to work with those local governments to um, give um, trust again, like from the local population and the government that they're there to support them, that they can provide services, they can reduce uh, violence. And that can really, I think, contribute to prevent recruitment and then uh, decrease the, the conflict. Thanks, Sandra. I'm going to try and squeeze in uh, three more questions in the last oh. two minutes. So <laughs> we had a couple of questions around um, girls in detention. So Arpita Mitra asks, did you find any good practices on reintegrating girls who were in detention and what were some of the, the risks or protective factors? And then Angelo Hernan Malencio um, says that in the Philippines, they've had cases where whole families have joined non-state armed groups. And sometimes it's only the girls who are released and reintegrated, not their families. And the challenges that that poses when their, their family support network isn't there. So I'm just curious if, if you came across anything um, around girls in detention during your research. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, there are experiences from Nigeria and from Iraq that I have in mind. This, in, um, I mean, girls in detention are at really high risk of uh, being sexually abused. And so there was a lot of research showing that. So really to prevent girl detention as much as we can is, is really, uh, it's really important. Then in terms of support, they will, um, yeah, definitely need support. In Iraq, there was an organization that was able to reduce the, the time of detention from few years uh, initially to one year in the end. And that was able, uh, they were able to release a lot of girls and, and shorten the, the sentence. And I think that it's, um, it's not ideal, of course, the, the best case scenario would be that they, they should not be there in the first place, but just being able to do that, then you reduce the risk that girls are exposed to. And I think as much as we can, you know, is to work with the, the local legal framework as well as the international one to, um, to support these girls. And the risk and the protective factors, there, there aren't, I mean, protective factors, there aren't that many. It's like this collective agency that some girls manage to, to establish sometimes where there are um, multiple girls who know each other and can, can organize themselves. For the Philippines, just looking now at time, um, yes, the Philippines is a case where it's often the whole family who was part of the group. Um, and, and in that case, it's extremely difficult to distinguish and to um, separate the family from the group and and it's the whole ideology that the family believes in so um, I don't have really um, an easy answer for this and and it's just to give access uh, to services for girls like to have uh, whether foster families or a supportive um, environment at home to to continue their studies I mean we cannot if parents still want to be part of a group it's not something we can really do anything about as child protection actor, but make sure there is 
a separation between the life in the armed group and, and the life of those girls to um, still go to school. I know the education was really a big deal there in, in the Philippines. Thanks so much, Sandra. I'm going to um, say a huge sorry to everyone who shared such good questions and we couldn't get to them. We had some questions around sustainability of funding, around yeah. girls' interaction with the legal and justice system and where they can find more resources. So um, thanks so much for everyone's super active participation. It was really a pleasure to hear from everybody's experiences and I'm sorry that we've run out of time. Um, we did receive a question on, you know, where we can find more resources. And earlier I mentioned that um, this technical note is part of a larger initiative um, in which plan alongside with other um, child protection um, interagency actors is developing a program toolkit, um, looking at yeah. um, programming for um, children associated with armed forces and armed groups. So please stay tuned for more information about that and where, the, where we will be piloting that. Um, but to wrap things up, I want to say a huge thank you to Sandra for joining us today, to all the participants. And um, Sarah, Sarah Lim has posted on the chat where you can find um, the recording and other materials that we'll be, we'll be sharing out over the next few months. So I hope I haven't missed anything, but a huge thanks and I wish all of you um, a very lovely rest of your day. Yes, thank you. Thank you to everyone.